What's old is new again. Wines made in Amphora have become all of the rage. The Georgians were probably the first to do this 8,000 years ago where they made wine in quaveries. These are terracotta vessels that were buried underground. All the fermentations, macerations took place in them. Around that time, it also took place in Armenia where they call it Karas. And all over the Mediterranean, places like Greece and Cyprus where they call it Pitos. In Portugal, they call it Tadia. Wines made in Amphora have become synonymous with orange wine natural wines, but all wines made in Amphora are not necessarily orange or natural wines. When you make these wines in Amphora, the grapes are crushed and then the skins, the seeds, the juice is all thrown into this clay vessel. Their fermentation takes place. Most of the time, Amphoras are a little bit wider up top and narrower in the center. That's supposed to increase circulation during the fermentation process. All the skins, the pips, the stems are supposed to fall to the bottom so the wine should clarify naturally. Naturally. Wine can also be made in amphora. It can be destemmed, it can be crushed, and clear juice can be just thrown in the amphora where fermentation takes place. And we have one of those here today. In that case, the wine is not an orange wine. It looks very similar to a normal white wine. When white grapes are macerated on the skins in amphora, it does become orange wine. Those skins impart flavor, color, structure, and some tannins. I know Georgians hate the word amphora. They always want to be called it quavery. Traditional quavery winemaking in Georgia is a little bit different because the quaveries there that range from about 1,000 to 3,000 liters, they have a little point at the bottom and then they're buried in the ground. The earths regulate the temperature. That's how some people made wine thousands and thousands of years ago when temperature controlled fermentation wasn't possible. I personally prefer wines that are fermented and aged in amphora, although a lot of producers ferment the wines in amphora, then they take the wines out and they age them in barrel just like a normal wine to stabilize the wine and add a little bit of flavor. The the only region I know of in the world where winemaking in Amphora is regulated is in the Alentejo in Portugal. There's actually an appellation there called Vinha de Tadia. The rules there are fairly loose, it's fairly simple. Basically the wines have to ferment in these Tadias, these Amphoras. They are not buried, they are above ground. Fermentation maceration takes place and the wine can only be accessed after St. Martin's Day, which I think is around November 11th. Near the bottom of the Amphora, they put a little tap and then the wine comes out naturally. Vigna d'Italia is an ode to traditions that took place when the Romans were there over 2,000 years ago. My wine career actually started in Georgia. That's where I fell in love with these quavery wines and I become fascinated with wines all over the world that were made in clay vessels. I just found the flavors to be absolutely fascinating. They're not boring at all, especially white wines made this style because they can be orange wine, they can be lightly macerated, or they can look like normal white wine. Reds, they can be real similar to classic red wines. One of the producers that really brought it to the forefront was Joshko Gravner. He's in Friuli Venezia Giulia, very famous wine. I actually tried to get a sample of that to show you guys because I love those wines, but they don't give out samples. When it comes to these wines, they're usually made in a limited production. It takes a lot of manpower to make them. When it comes to these wines, I don't necessarily think that you're paying for quality. The wines can be fantastic, but you're paying for style, tradition, story, and the producer's artist expression. Okay, I have five different white wines made in Amphora from all over the world, all five different countries. I'm not gonna taste these blind because they're all white grapes and they're made with different styles. However, stay tuned to an upcoming video where I am gonna do a blind tasting of red wines made in Amphora. Let's get rolling. Big wines, big aromatics. I'm gonna be tasting out of a big glass. This is the Rovsia Burgundy glass. This is the best inexpensive glass I've ever used. I'll put a link in the description box if you wanna check them out. Okay, I think we're gonna play this like a little guessing game. You guys enjoy seeing me struggle. Now you're gonna struggle a little bit. I'm gonna taste the wines. You can follow along, see if you can guess the grape, and at the end I'll reveal the label. Fair enough. Let's go by style first. We're going to Greece. We're going to the island of Santorini. This is a high acid grape variety. You don't usually associate with Amphora wines. I know there are a couple wines made in Amphora out of this grape. This is the first producer that I think that I actually tasted. This is a little clearer. This wine is crushed, destemmed, and pressed, so this is not an orange wine. The clear juice is then thrown into the Amphora, and then it sits on the leaves for four months. Let's give it a go here. This uh, is very intriguing, very nice nose. Smells like a classic white wine. Banana, slate, slate, slate minerals white peach, intense lime, limestone, lemon type flavors. I personally love the nose, love it. Wine's usually made in the style. 
and minimal fining, minimum filtration. In order for a wine to be stable and to make it to you clear, so nothing else take, whoa, this has got a long finish. Wines are usually fined and filtered so nothing crazy happens in the bottle. These type of wines, that usually doesn't take place so there's a little bit more texture. This, <laughs> Perfect balance to me of acidity, minerality, and then fruit. Sometimes these high acid mineral driven wines can be a little too sharp, a little hard, and not have enough fruit. This has enough lemon, white fruit flavors. I haven't had this for many vintages, and I have to say that this is extraordinary. I know it's not cheap. This is uh, the signature grape variety of Santorini in Greece. I'm sure you guessed it. This is Assertico. The Celepos Ludia Santorini Canava Crisu 2019. 70 bucks. Not cheap at all. For me, 93 plus type of wine. I think this is extraordinary. It's 70 bucks, it's not cheap, but it's really good. I really had to get myself going to do this video today, but that just got me really excited. Let's move on. We're going to the island of Sardinia. So this is Italian wine. I had the very first vintage of this wine. I think this one currently maybe is the third or fourth vintage. I know this producer personally, so I haven't tasted it in a long time. This is a very famous grape. You'll also see it in the south of France and in Liguria, Tuscany, as well. This was fermented and macerated for 10 months, I think. That's what I could, that's the information I could find on the producer's website. Let's give it a go. It's a little bit lighter in color. Doesn't look like a full-fledged orange, orange wine. Looks more like a barrel fermented white. Sometimes people complain when you have maceration that you take away the sense of place, the taste of the grape. I don't feel that's the case if you're tasting a lot of macerated wines. I still taste this grape in the glass. Pineapple, a little bit of natural gas, flint, kind of dried yellow peaches, salt, 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 extremely complex. For being on the skins for so long, there isn't a lot of tannin at all. And it also has the fullness of like a barrel fermented Chardonnay. When the skins sit on the juice for so long, if it's macerated for a long time, sometimes the skins can reabsorb tannins and reabsorb color. Fruity in the first wine, but still extraordinary. I think this is very friendly. It still tastes like the grape. That grape is of course a Vermentino. This is the Antonella Corda. This is the Ciru. 2020, 45 bucks, not a cheap wine. I think this is, to me, 92 points. I gave this, I think I gave that 93 plus. It still tasted like Vermentino. Didn't have the acidity of the first one. I crave acidity, but I still think it was excellent. Excellent wine. A lot of complaints of some of these wines, not all the time, but some of them are made more minimal intervention with lower sulfur, native yeast. Sometimes they can be a little bit funky. Sometimes people complain about that, but these are squeaky clean. Let's move on. We're starting to move on to wines that are more orange type wines. This is the most affordable wine in the bunch. This is from the Alentejo in Portugal. It's a blend. In Portugal, it's all about blending. I love Portuguese wines. This is a producer that makes wines and Amphora that not only available, but they're pretty affordable. This isn't as explosive as the other two, but nonetheless, it's good. This is almost like I taste, I almost smell the clay pot here. It's almost like dried pear and peach skins, like Asian pear. For a wine that sees a lot of maceration, these don't smell like orange wines at all. <laughs> Slate clay. You get a spike of acidity. It has pretty good length. It's maybe not as complex as these two, but at this price, I think this is a great entry point if you want to start. I mean, to me, to me, this wine is very easily 90 points, has texture, has length. When these wines hang out on the skins, they gain body, they gain complexity. It's got a zippy, lemony finish. I'm gonna give it a half a point more, 90 plus. And this is a wine you can find from 17 to 20 US dollars. This is the Herdado Rosims Amphora Branco, white Amphora, Antal Vaz, 40%, 20% Perum, 20% Rabo de Overdia, and 20% Mateudo. The Antal Vaz really sticks out here, the lemony, the slatiness. It's kind of a simple grape in the Alentejo, but I've tasted wines that are serious before. I think at 20 bucks, that's an excellent way to get an Amphora wine. I've been to the Alentejo before. I did the little Vino d'Italia crawl where I went to different old cellars, tasted wines directly from the Amphora with some of the old professors, including one that's called Professor Talia. That's kind of helped to bring this tradition back to life. It's a real interesting place. Portuguese wines are usually lower cost in general. I think the Alentejo is a great place to start, great place to look. Next up is a grape that I really like. It's from Istria, Croatia, but it's also grown throughout that North Adriatic region in Slovenia, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, and Italy. And it's a grape where I think its destiny is to be made in the style wine, and wine that has skin contact, that has maceration. Again, you can make an orange wine without it being made in amphora. This is different than the other three so far because 
it was fermented macerated M4, then it was aged in wood. There are a lot of guys uh, in Croatia that are friends with Joško Gravner. They've traveled to Georgia with him. This is actually made in a Georgian quavery. They import quaveries together, they bury them. This guy claims that he had quaveries and he was making wine before Gravner. You know, it's really hard to regulate that, people. You know, in the wine industry, it's all about he said, she said. Let's give it a go. I think this grape does fantastic when it's macerated because the skins have this nice flavor when they, they become ripe. And they just, the tannins are really, really nice. Nice golden color. Let's give it a smell here. Very aromatically different than these other three wines. This is very explosive. Lots of dandelion, yellow flower, daffodil come out. Dried apricot, sweet peach, white pepper, tons of white pepper. Full bodied, the tans are sweet. They have like these sweet peach and sweet apricot flavors. This wine is aromatically a little bit more impressive than the other three. On the palate, it doesn't come together as nicely as like the, the best one right here. So far, the best one for me, number one. It's so funny because in the front, the nose is all nice. There's a little bit dip in the mid palate and then the end palate is great with that sweet fruit. For me, I'd put it at a solid 90 points. I think it's very good. It's a really good example of this style of the grape. And I've had it aged before and it ages pretty well. This is Malvasia Istarska from Croatia or Malvasia Istriana. It's a strand of Malvasia that's not related to the other Malvasias throughout Greece and Italy. I think there are about 50 of them. This is the Cabula Amphora Malvasia Istarska, 2019, 52 bucks. I like how producers that are serious about making this wine talk about how you have to have the best grapes possible and you have to keep the Amphoras squeaky clean other it's not a magic box you can't just throw crap grapes in it because the wine will be a disaster good wine let's move on okay we're going to the motherland we're going to georgia this is the most common white grape variety in georgia it reminds me a little bit of ribola gialla in italy ribola in slovenia ribola gialla is what gravner uses to make his wine when georgia was under soviet control they used it because the yields were high it could be thin and insipid and just acid water went over cropped however when it's macerated i think it's fantastic the tannins are usually pretty strong really pretty biting this has got a deep golden color a little shy, but this is refined stuff here. This is full-fledged orange wine. This is from Cajeti, which is one of the more famous areas in Georgia. It's a gorgeous area. It's like the Napa Valley of Georgia. Huge fertile valley, and in the backdrop, you see the Caucasus Mountains, that are the highest mountains in Europe. It's a really spectacular place. I'm gonna be back there in September, so I'm excited. This smells leather, dried apricots, dried peaches, a little bit of white pepper, lemon even, a little bit of lemon zest. Has some pretty strong tannins. This is complex, this is like a thinking wine. When you have heavily macerated wines like this, I almost think of it almost like cognac. You have to sit there, you have to think about it. When you have heavily macerated wines like this, I think they go really nice with pork, braised pork dishes especially. Tans on this aren't use, aren't as strong as I usually expect with this grape. I think it's really good. I think I'm going to give it 91 points. Can you guess the variety? It is. It's Ricazzatelli. <laughs> Ricazzatelli. This is the Chateau Zagani uh, Kakuri. This is 2013, only 8,000 bottles, fermented and aged in quavery. Only 12% alcohol. 2013, so it's got the most age on it. Now, here's the sad thing. They don't make this wine anymore. This is just for the archive, but I just really wanted to show a Georgian wine. So tell me, do you like wines that are made in M4? Do you have any favorites, any favorite producers? Are you curious about the genre? Let me know in the comments below.